Good afternoon, traders and investors. Will back here with another one coming to with a Monday market update. Hope everybody had a beautiful day and a gorgeous weekend as well. And in today's markets, guys, we had another very wild and volatile day. What started off as a beautiful green day, much of a recovery after the weekend tensions were kind of alleviated. Iran launched a missile strike on Israel, of course, and did no damage. And all was supposed to be in the clear for today. But However, that did not play out as anticipated on the course of the morning. After we started off fairly green, Israel came out and said they were potentially um, planning for a retaliation strike against Iran, but no immediate plans as to when that may happen. So that was a major piece of news on the day. Number two piece of news on the day, which kind of lifted markets in the morning, was retail sales data. Now, retail sales data came in very strong. It showed that the consumers are still spending and the economy is still healthy. But that is a double edged sword because it once again reiterates the fact that inflation may be a little bit more stickier if people keep spending, which eventually leads to rate cuts being priced in further and further down the road. Now analysts expecting the first rate cut to potentially come in as late as the month of September. And then third, we had some bank earnings this morning. We had earnings come from Goldman Sachs and Charles Schwab two of our major banks in the markets right now. And for the most part, those earnings were very good. It really came off the back of last Friday's earnings as well from JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citigroup, which all showed that the banking sector is very, very strong, despite reporting somewhat soft net interest income. So in today's video, guys, a ton of things to cover. We're going to go over those retail sales headlines, see how those impacted the markets. We're going to take a look at those bank earnings very briefly in terms of Charles Schwab and Goldman Sachs. Then we're going to dive into our technical analysis on major market indexes and our major big tech names. And lastly, we do have one subscriber um, one subscriber request coming from Asan, and he was requesting if we can do ADMA and TRMD. So no problem at all. We'll do those at the end of the video. And after we do those, we will take a look into my portfolio, see how we ended the week last week and how we started the week off this week as well. So without further ado, guys, let's get into today's charged video shall we so on the day spy down 1.25 percent qq down 1.65 percent and i swear guys everything was so green in the morning we had a very nice gap up open on the spy we were up about 0.85 percent and it all got washed away the market is indeed slightly crashing in terms of qqq same concept on qqq we were up very nicely on the morning 0.85 percent as well and then we had the largest top to bottom decline in the past one year. Yes, in the past one year, top to bottom on QQQ, you're talking about two and a half percent to the downside. Really a landslide of red as a whole, guys. Take a look at the heat map as well. It was not pretty. It was not as bad as last Friday. Last Friday, everything was bright red. This time, still red, but not as bad as last Friday, despite the waterfall drop. Most of your technology names were heavily in the red. CRM dropping 7.28%. In terms of healthcare, guys, healthcare was fairly mixed on the day. Financials and healthcare were really some of your outperformers on the morning, guys. Financials at one point over the course of the morning was up a healthy 1.6% after those bank earnings. It just goes to show you the earnings from the banks have been very good so far. In terms of healthcare as well, healthcare got a nice little bump in the morning, about 1.21%, and even healthcare gave everything back. So not a very healthy day on the markets, and your bottom half of the market as well was fairly negative. Only a few gains here, guys in some of your capital markets institutions that we're reporting today. Intel with a bright little green spot and a few healthcare names as well. But the rest, guys, pretty, pretty red indeed. On the one day relative, you can see that even better. Everything in the red led down, unfortunately, by technology, real estate, communication services. And on the one week relative performance, guys, well, you guessed it, every single major sector in the red after we've had these heightened tensions and increased volatility. Take a look at the VIX. The VIX is up 11% on the day. And we are now at the highest level we have been since last October, even after the three month sell off that started last fall, early on in August and lasted through October. We only got as high as about 21 on the VIX. We are almost there and the sell off has barely started. Most of this VIX, I will agree with you guys, 
Friday and yesterday. It is due to geopolitical tensions, basically not going to stay in the markets, right? If these tensions get alleviated, if peace talks start getting underway, well, obviously the volatility will decrease. But now is just a time of heightened tensions. We started off these markets during the month of March with a few hot inflation reports and the market got a little bit nervous here at the top on the SPY and the QQQ. And that's what we were talking about, guys. The heightened concerns for elevated inflation and pushing back interest rate cuts into the later part of the year. That made the markets fairly nervous and the markets were kind of just waiting around. Can company earnings deliver on the expectation that's been set over the last four or five months of rally? Or have we potentially overshot too much to the upside? That's why the markets were hesitating in this range. Now, add fuel to that fire, geopolitical tensions, and it gives the market the perfect pretext to really start taking some of those gains off the tables taking profit and repositioning to the downside for some short-term drawdowns and some short-term volatility. All right. So with all that said, guys, let's get into the report that came out this morning in terms of our retail sales, because it did show a couple of things. So retail sales jumped 0.7% in March, much higher than expected. Take a look at the expectation here, guys. The expectation was for 0.3% month over month increase. It came in very hot at 0.7%. However, the markets didn't really react negatively to that because as I was saying, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It shows that consumers are healthy in terms of how much they can spend because of the wage increases that have been occurring over the past year. However, it does show that if they continue spending, well, inflation may just be a little sticky for a little bit longer. Let's take a look in the article, guys. Rising inflation in March didn't deter consumers who continued shopping at a more rapid pace than anticipated. That's the higher than expected number, right? The biggest growth area for the month was online sales. That's good for Amazon, up 2.7%, while miscellaneous retailers saw an increase of 2.1%. Multiple categories did report declines in sales for the months, however. Sporting goods were down, hobbies were down as well. Musical instruments and books posted a 1.8% decrease, while clothing stores were off 1.6%, and electronics and appliances saw a 1.2% drop. So it still goes to show, guys, that in terms of broad market consumer spending coming back, not really, right? Consumer discretionary spending is still somewhat low as high interest rates really put pressure on consumers. And as you can see, guys, most of your consumers are shopping online. And more specifically, I don't think, guys, that they are shopping for discretionary items. It's most likely items that they do need. Now, here's a quote. Strong sales growth in March salvaged an otherwise mediocre quarter for retailers, said Jim Baird, chief investment officer at Plant Moran Financial Advisors. Q1 growth isn't going to generate a round of high fives, but closing out the quarter on a strong note should allow them to breathe a sigh of relief and a glimmer of hope that momentum could carry through into the coming months. So this is a little hint at company earnings that are coming up over the next month here, guys. Company earnings should largely be fairly good. At least that was the guidance that we got in January from most of your major retailers and most of your big tech names alike. Resilient consumer spending has helped keep the economy afloat despite higher interest rates and concerns over stubborn inflation. So that consumer spending is doing a great job of keeping the economy higher. But once again, as I said before, kind of contributing to sticky inflation. Now, alongside the recent uh, resurgence in employment growth, the continued resilience of consumption is another reason to suspect the Fed will wait longer before starting to cut interest rates, which now we think won't happen until September. So that is the gist of retail sales. Once again, quick summary, double-edged sword. The consumer is healthy, the jobs market is healthy, the economy is healthy, but what does that cause, guys? It causes inflation to be a little bit more sticky than expected, and the rate cuts that the market's been so greedy and anticipating for, it is going to have to wait a little bit longer now. So we'll be curious to see what Jerome Powell has to say about all this on his conference coming up for um, at the early weeks in May. So that is pretty much everything for your retail sales number. Now let's take a look guys at some of your banks that reported today. So Goldman Sachs, one of your stronger investment banking names, that's for sure. They reported fantastic earnings. As a matter of fact, at the height of their earnings uh, released this morning, they were up almost 6% before giving it back because of all the geopolitical uncertainty headlines surrounding Israel and Iran. Take a look at their earnings. We're not gonna spend too much time on this at all. Take a look at their EPS beat guys. 
2% EPS beat. That came off the backs of record quarters for a number of their business divisions, and even a nice 10% beat on the revenue number as well. Very, very solid earnings, guys. This comes in line. All of your major banks so far have not disappointed. Now, they've all pretty much ended kind of red on uh, after their earnings, but it was not because of what the institutions did. It's just because of market sentiment. Think of Friday and today. All of the gains were overshadowed with negative comments in terms of geopolitical headlines coming out of Israel and Iran. So it's not these companies' faults. It's just the market is not holding up gains right now with that heightened fear on the table. Let's take a look at Charles Schwab as well. Charles Schwab did amazing too, guys, up on earnings by about 1% on EPS and a nice little beat on revenue by about half percent as well. So they had a double beat and actually did very, very good with their brokerage, brokerage division and it caused the stock to rally up to highs of almost 5% as well before giving a lot of that back here, guys. Just take a look, right? Earnings come out and then the market is suffering. They were not spared. So let's take a look at Goldman Sachs earnings first and then we'll take a look at Charles Schwab. So here's just a few of the headlines. We're not gonna be doing a full fundamental breakdown, guys for the banks because their balance sheets are relatively boring. Uh, so just the major headlines should suffice for, in my opinion, for this. So Goldman Sachs tops first quarter estimates fueled by trading and investment banking. Very, very decent report by Goldman Sachs, guys. Take a look at these profits. The bank said profit jumped 28% from the year earlier period, thanks to a rebound in capital markets activities. Revenue rose 16%, topping the analyst estimates by more than a billion dollars. Very strong results, guys. Goldman's results are likely the best of its big bank peers this quarter. Like rivals JP Morgan Chase and Citigroup, which each posted better than expected trading and investment banking results for the first quarter, Goldman took advantage of improving conditions since the start of the year. They're talking about improved financial conditions and improved investor sentiment to the markets. Large, high net worth clients are deploying more money in these markets, and it's been showing with the releases we got from JP Morgan, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs so far. Now, I've said before, here we have a quote, another one of our quotes here. I've said before that the historically depressed levels of activity wouldn't last forever, said the CEO of the company. CEOs need to make strategic decisions for their firms. Companies of all sizes need to raise capital and financial sponsors need to transact to generate returns for their investors. It's clear that we're in the early stages of a reopening of the capital markets. This is extremely, extremely bullish, guys. The big money is finally deploying capital. They no longer have cold feet towards these markets. They understand that the overall context of these markets is we're at the beginning of an overall bull market, guys. You can see that best on the SPY, right? Monthly uptrends, healthy economic backdrop as well. Are there a few uncertainties? Yes, but was it enough to deter high net worth clients from brokering more deals and investing more money? No, and that is what you wanna see, guys. You want to see the big players in these markets deploying capital even at high interest rates right now. It means that they believe as well that times are just going to get better as we progress further on in this year and through 2025 as well, AKA the bull market is here and the bull market is likely here to stay. Now, continuing on the article, unlike more diversified rivals, Goldman gets most of its revenue from Wall Street activities. That can lead to outsized returns during boom times and underperformance when markets don't cooperate. So if Goldman beat on all accounts, guys, that, that, does that lead to the fact that we're in a boom time or are they underperforming because the times are rough, right? Well, obviously they're outperforming, so we must be in a boom cycle. That is very, very bullish, guys. For Goldman Sachs, very, very good. What they said further on in the call, guys, increase in all their divisions, increase in IPO requests, increase in, in mergers and acquisitions, increase in private wealth management fees, increase in investment banking fees. All of these combined, guys, all of their divisions are marching forward. And that was reiterated by your bank earnings last week, aka all of these banks are extremely healthy and their high net worth clients are starting to deploy large sums of money into the markets. The number one concern for the bank so far, the reason that a few analysts were kind of timid on their earnings uh, forecasts for these banks is just because of net interest income was down. Now, net interest income, guys, I'll explain it very, very easily. It's just the difference that the money makes on the bank between what it borrows from the Federal Reserve as opposed to what it lends out to you, the consumer, or to other businesses that requires loan. So banks are able to borrow 
at the Fed funds rate. They're able to borrow between five and a quarter and five and a half percent. And then if they want to lend that money out to you, they'll charge you six and a half, seven and a half percent for it. So they'll mark it up one to two percent in that respect. And obviously, if you have a savings account with the bank, well, they're not going to pay you the Fed funds rate, right? They're not, they're not going to pay you five and a quarter, five percent. They will pay you four and a half, four point seven five percent. So they're pocketing money both ways. The reason that it's coming, that the net interest income is coming in a bit soft is not because it's not because they make less margins when interest rates are high. It's just because demand for loans is lower as a whole, as a byproduct of this high interest rate environment, right? If loans, guys, if the federal funds rate is at two and a half or even 3%, right? If, if interest rates are low, the bank is going to make the same spread. They will lend money to you. Let's say the federal funds rate is 3%. They'll lend you money at four, four and a half percent, and they'll pay savings. To, uh, if the, the federal funds rate is 3% and that's what they're getting, they'll pay depositors, maybe even 2%. They'll make the same spread regardless of what interest rates are. That's not the problem. The problem is loan demand, right? If they don't have a heavy, heavy loan pipeline because loan rates are high right now, well, obviously they can make less money, right? Because there's just less demand, they're issuing less loans. So that's the gist of things for interest, um, uh, interest income. So as a byproduct of rates coming down later in the year, we can expect more commercial loans, more business loans, and more personal loans to come back and really help boost these banks' net interest income numbers that have come in a little bit softer than expected. So all in all, guys, no red flags at all in any of these banks. Extremely, extremely bullish earnings from all of them. Now let's take a look at Charles Schwab. So Charles Schwab revenue beats estimates on higher asset management fees. So Charles Schwab obviously going through their merger with TD Ameritrade over the past two years. That is pretty much done. They are now the largest broker in North America by trading volume. And they also have displayed record profits because now that markets are good, well, trading profits have been at records because people are obviously trading more in these markets. So let's take a look at some of these headlines right here. So for Charles Schwab, first quarter revenue exceeded Wall Street estimates on Monday, helped by a jump in asset management fees and client assets rising to a record high. So more people trading and more people investing alike. Still, overall profit at the brokerage shrank 15% on higher interest paid on client deposits and its own borrowing. So once again, a little bit of a shortfall due to higher interest rate environment, right? Although their trading profits are coming nicely up, they're getting hit with that higher than expected interest that they have to pay on savings accounts and whatnot. So their margins are getting a little bit compressed, but all in all, not that big of a deal in my opinion here, guys, right? The bank is still uh, posting very, very juicy profits, even for this, um, you know, their profits might've been down 15%, but in terms of net profits, guys, Charles, Charles Schwab, they really never have a bad uh, quarter as a whole. You can see my head's in the way right now, but their most recent quarter, pretty much, we're talking about 16, 15% net margins. Extremely, extremely good here, guys, right? So against an improved macroeconomic backdrop, clients entrusted us with 96 billion in core new net investment assets, including 45 billion in the month of March alone. That is extremely bullish, guys. People are coming back to the markets, coming back to invest more heavily. A rebound in markets has boosted the value of assets under management at brokerages, allowing them to pocket higher fees, even if fewer clients put their money into the funds. They're talking obviously about mutual funds and ETFs here. That helped total client assets at the Westlake Texas-based company reach a record of $9.1 trillion, up 20% on year on the year. So record amount of assets under management for Charles Schwab as well. This is the case for all of your major banks that have reported quarterly earnings so far. They are all at record levels of assets under management. Does that scream bear market or does that scream bull market to you? Well, quick little hint, guys. Very, very bullish, right? Now, asset management and administration fees earned from managing mutual funds and exchange traded funds jumped 21%. That's good. Now, here we dive into a little bit of uh, your macro and how the macro plays into these bank earnings, right? So rate hikes by the US Federal Reserve have compelled companies like Schwab to increase the interest they pay on deposits. As we were saying, they will now give you a savings rate for four and a half percent on money you deposit with them, right? So a crucial source of capital that is used to invest in interest earning assets and give out loans, obviously. Schwab has also taken on debt to bolster its funding, pressuring interest revenue further. Net interest revenue, the difference between interest earned on assets and paid out on liabilities, 
fell 19%. This is in line with what we just explained a couple minutes back. Same thing that JP Morgan said as well, right? Now, the company on average paid 1.35% on deposits in three months ended March 31st, compared with 0.73% last year. So net increase on how much they have to pay in deposits. Obviously, that erodes net margins, but the damage, guys, is not that bad in my opinion. It is a temporary and cyclical thing. So with all that out of the way, guys, those are pretty much your bank earnings. As a whole summary, everything is very, very bullish. Record assets under management, record investment banking fees, record wealth management and trading fees. No red flags at all, except for your net interest income numbers coming in slow, you know, a little bit softer than expected. But that is to be expected in an environment here, guys, where a lot of people are choosing to save money rather than get loans. Right. So obviously that's a problem when the bank makes a lot of money on loans and the loan division is down and then you have a lot of people deposit depositing cash and earning interest on that cash. Well, the banks are kind of getting pressured from both of those sides. But as I said, guys, it will not last forever. In my opinion, it's still very, very overall bullish context for financial stocks in the context of interest rates coming down later on in the year. I really do believe that this is a start to a new bullish cycle for financials after really being in the mud the last two years. We're finally turning that corner and a lot of these financials names should be able to have a very good 2024 and very good 2025 as well. Just take a look at some of your projections here uh, on Goldman Sachs for EPS moving on in the forward. We'll do a couple of these in a row just to show you guys that really there's nothing to fear, right? Take a look at this EPS expansion, Goldman Sachs the next four years, revenue expansion the next four years. Take another one of the largest players in the game right now right? JP Morgan, JP Morgan, next four years, right? EPS expansion, although not as aggressive, it is still expanding. Very, very good. And revenue expansion over the next couple of years as well. Take a look at Citigroup. Citigroup, one of the banks that got beaten down hard after the 2008 recession, even there projected to have a few very good years ahead of them. EPS expansion, revenue expansion, and the one we just covered recently, guys, Charles Schwab as well, right? Charles Schwab, net EPS expansion, very good growth and very nice revenue growth as well. So the backdrop is overall bullish for your banks. Nothing has changed there. So hopefully that was insightful in terms of a quick summary here on your bank earnings. Apologies for not spending too much time on them and not giving you guys valuation ratios. If you guys really want me to, I'll probably end up doing a separate video here on all of your bank earnings. We have a few more earnings for the week here, guys. Tomorrow, we do get Bank of America uh, as one of your other large institutions reporting and Morgan Stanley, too. So once those two will be reported, guys, I might put together a 40, 45 minute video where I go a bit more in detail on all of the banks, compare them amongst each other and figure out which one is the most fairly priced as a whole. For the rest of the earnings this week, guys, we have some fairly interesting one, right? We have interactive brokers coming in Tuesday after the close. Then on Wednesday, we have a very heavy day here, guys. We have uh, some of your healthcare issues starting as early as tomorrow, right? United Health, Johnson & Johnson, huge players in the healthcare group. On Wednesday, we have Abbott Labs, another very large component of your XLV healthcare uh, ETF. Obviously, uh, as we just said, we have ASML, one of the largest semiconductor plays. And then on Thursday, we get TSMC, another one of your largest uh, semiconductor plays too, as well as Netflix. So very big days on Thursday. Thursday, we as well get DR Horton, which is going to be one of our home builders. Curious to see what they have to say on that. And then on Friday, we get American Express and Procter & Gamble. Those are going to be very good um, insights into how is consumer spending and how do they forecast consumer spending to be lasting throughout the rest of the year in terms of the guidance that they're going to give. So very good start to the week. Uh, for this fresh new earning cycle that is going to be lasting here over the next four, five, six weeks. So very excited to see what all these companies have to say about the current state of the markets and if they still guide for increases in EPS, increases in net margins and decent cash flow. So we'll take this one day at a time as usual here. Now let's dive right into our technical analysis, shall we? So in terms of SPY, guys, it's not looking too pretty. I'll be very honest with you. We lost a key level today. So we lost the weekly higher lows, right? This was a very healthy weekly uptrend. Now we've engulfed 100% of the move and the bears are gaining momentum. So loss of the weekly uptrend, that is significant. It has not happened on SPY since pretty much last fall. So now we have our third start to the week. Well, it's only been one day, but looking like the third red week in a row, take a look at last October, Couple weeks down, a little bit of retracement, continuation to the downside if macro does not improve. So this type of scenario 
could be playing out if ever earnings are underwhelming and if ever inflation fears continue in the markets and heightened geopolitical tensions continue in the markets as well. We could end up in a scenario exactly like last fall, guys. This is literally pretty much exactly what happened last fall. Why did this sell-off start happening right here? We got two months of inflation reports that came in hotter than expected. Inflation started uptrending a little bit again, and Jerome Powell had to say, higher for longer. We're pushing back the idea of rate cuts. We're not even thinking about them right now. That caused some panic in the markets, which culminated, funny enough, in the October 7th event where Hamas attacked Israel for the first time. That gave us our last leg of sell-off. All of the things that plagued markets back then are the exact same things that are coming back now, right? Inflation, two, three months in a row have now been ticking to the upside and now heightened tensions that we did not have this entire time, right? There were tensions, but now they've been escalated between Israel, Iran, and Hamas, right? Now we're coming into the same market context as we had back here. But guys, in my opinion, we're, these are still, still, still just temporary items, right? So can we be potentially looking at a heavier sell-off and maybe even further monthly consolidation for April and May if ever earnings are not good, which could bring us back into our previous all-time highs. Maybe potentially yes, guys, right? And that would be a sell-off of about 8% on the S&P 500. That's exactly the amount that we dropped last fall as well. So all in all, guys, this is healthy consolidation. And don't tell me for one second that we haven't been talking about this on the channel. We've literally been talking about this, guys, since late February and early March when markets were disregarding inflation, we were talking about the red flags that were starting to mount and mount and mount. And then Jerome Powell gave us the green light back here, but there was still a bit of hesitancy, a bit, a bit of hesitancy, a bit of reluctancy for the markets to really increase in price much before we had further, um, you know, guidance on earnings and before we have some better data in terms of inflation, right? So that's pretty much the state of the markets right now. Daily downtrend is clear as day. As soon as this daily pressure and this daily selling pressure wears off, right? We're now one hour oversold conditions on the S&P. We're almost in four hour oversold conditions. So as soon as this move bottoms out, and how do you know it's bottomed out? We need to see a recapture of the hourly trend. As soon as we get that recapture of the hourly trend, well, your daily bounce will be underway. But now the bears guys have put in a sizable move to the downside at this point. Any bounce, we'll just be looking for a high, lower high or potential lower low continuation in these markets if our macro backdrop does not improve. And until we get some big tech earnings that may be able to save these markets, Netflix reports this week, Tesla reports the week after, and then the week after as well, guys, we have pretty much all of major big tech reporting, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and the likes of all of them, right? So those are going to be ones to watch. Can we potentially dip until those big tech earnings? And then we may be able to see, right? If we just dip until those big tech earnings, and then we may be able to see a little bit of a relief rally because of those big tech earnings, similar to here. And then we have to reevaluate once we're at this point right here. We're going to have to reevaluate. That'll be early May. We're going to have another CPI report. We're going to have another meeting with Jerome Powell as well. That is when the markets will reevaluate. Well, is it enough? Are we through the fear? Are we good now? Or is there still more work to be done and potentially get into something like this, right? So keep a close eye on these levels here, guys. We've lost the lows right now. Just looking for these to bottom out for potential bearish continuation to the downside, potential continued weekly consolidation as well, right? So just an unfortunate, unfortunate state in the markets right now. The red flags are now too big for the bulls to ignore, in my opinion. And we have crosses on the MACD, especially on the weekly right here. You can see it best on the weekly cross on the MACD for the SPY in the first time since the month of pretty much, well, since pretty much your first cross back here, which lasted all the way through the month of October. So now your bears, guys, the bears are in short-term control, daily timeframes, weekly timeframes as well, which means we're likely heading into monthly consolidation, April, and potentially even into May. Don't wanna to get uh, too much ahead of ourselves, guys, but that is definitely what it is looking like to be shaping up. Now, moving on to QQQ. So QQQ, guys, same concept as well, right? QQQ was kind of trapped in this range of consolidation right here, but now we really do have a clear break to the downside, clear bear break to the downside, inability to reset the daily uptrend by breaking the high of pretty much two Thursdays ago at this point. And now we get the flush. So unfortunately, guys, your daily downtrend is simply confirmed at this point on QQQ. And QQQ has now flushed your weekly higher lows as well. It was a gorgeous weekly uptrend this entire time. Hesitation at the top. 
and now we have flushed the lows. So now the weekly bull, the weekly bears are in full control. This weekly time frame, first weekly downtrend on QQQ. They join other bears in the market that have already set weekly downtrends in the names of healthcare, right? So QQQ joining Team Bear. Unfortunately, we need to see how big tech earnings are going to weigh in uh, on this most recent sell-off here on the QQQs. But one thing's for sure, guys, we're also losing the 12 EMA simultaneously, right? And your MACD has now crossed momentum pointing down to the downside. So just not looking very strong. We're really looking fairly weak in the markets at this point, right? The only thing, right? The only the next layer, area of support is gonna be the level prior to the NVIDIA earnings. That's gonna be roughly the 422 level. Just a quick reminder, any bounce at this point, guys, gonna be looking for a higher low, for potential downside continuation here and really get this weekly uh, downtrend here in motion by the bears right now, which will just lead into healthy, healthy, healthy monthly consolidation. The worst, in my opinion, could come down all the way to your prior all-time highs back here, and that will be a sell-off top to bottom on the QQQs of about 10%, which is still a little bit ways away. It's still about 5 6% from these current levels. So just keep those levels in mind, guys. Overall, we're still very bullish, but the bears are getting short-term control. We may just be getting some choppy, sideways, volatile, slightly down action here for the next couple of weeks until we get our big tech earnings. And thereafter, early on in May, we have to reevaluate with a new CPI report, a new meeting from Jerome Powell, and those company earnings. Those will all provide us some further insight as to whether or not the month of May as well will be monthly consolidation, or if only this a bit of uh, skittishness in the markets early April will be the extent of the damage. So we're going to keep an eye closely on that now, guys. But as I've said for the past month, month and a half at this point, great time to be raising some cash, writing covered calls, and just being fairly conservative on the market. It's the time to build our shopping lists it's the time to be buying companies that we love. Everybody, when markets are bullish like this, right? Everybody complains that they can't buy companies because they've ran too much. And now when we start selling down aggressively and all of your favorite companies come into buy zones that you've been waiting for for a month, two months, three months at this point, because we're scared, because there's so much fear and uncertainty in the markets right now, nobody wants to buy them, right? Guys, we've been waiting for these levels for two Three months, all of our favorite companies have run away from us. Now that they're coming back to us, we have to buy them. The overall backdrop context is still bullish. So do not get shaken out of these markets because of short-term fear catalysts that will not stand the test of time, right? We have to be buying these companies. So that one thing's for sure. Let's get our shopping list together and going shopping. You do not have to be fearful, right? If you're, if we're, if we're the whole three months, right? If you're saying this entire three months, I can't wait for a pullback so that we can finally buy. And then when the pullback finally happens, you get scared of buying guys. We have to rework the psychology here, right? You have to be buying, extend your time horizon. Or if you're too nervous, buy more high conviction quality companies. That is the number one thing you have to do, right? None of the fundamentals of any of these companies have changed because of the short-term fear-driven sell-offs that we've gotten recently, guys. Just understand that, please. Now, moving on to financials here. So financials down about 0.5% on the day. Clear, clear, clear break here, guys, right? We're losing the moving average on everything. Loss it on QQQ. Clear loss of the moving averages here on financials as well, right? So financials, clear, clear, clear daily downtrend underway right now. A lot of selling pressure down here. On the one hour, we are pretty much short-term oversold. As soon as we get that hourly, day, uh, the hourly trend change in motion, looking like the bulls tried for it today, but just got washed away uh, by the Israel-Iran headlines, right? So as soon as we do get that hourly trend change underway, we'll be watching for the size of the bounce in relation to this high right here, $42, right? Weak bounce, we can just expect a continued rollover. We do have overhead resistance right now. The moving average is up here at about $41 acting as resistance. And now we're below our red box. The previous all-time highs were below them once again. They will be acting as resistance as well. At least financials bulls have a lot of room on the weekly here to set the weekly higher lows and then potentially make a bounce attempt. If they can't get a V-shape going, well, at least they can do it in two steps. So looking forward to gauge the size of the bounce when it happens here, but I would not be surprised guys if we get lower high into lower low continuation extension of this maybe weekly consolidation to the downside right so we're going to keep a close eye on this on financials but all in all healthy healthy pullback after such an extended 
five month period of rally, just looking for the monthly higher low for further trend continuation. Where I think this bottoms, guys, most likely 38 to 37 area. This is such a juicy spot. As a matter of fact, let me mark it with a little green box here so everybody understands that this is the buy zone for financials, right? It is pretty much the breakout of this range of consolidation breakout. Now we're trying to retest, retest prior all-time high support, retest prior resistance, which is now support right here, and your monthly moving averages are there, and that would be a drawdown top to bottom on financials of about nine, eight, nine percent which is exactly the same as we got pretty much at the extent of last October, eight, nine, ten percent right? So that would all make sense still in an overall bullish context on your longer term timeframes. Now moving on to XLV. So XLV also in the context of this daily downtrend, tried to make an attempt at the hourly trend change today, but unfortunately got rejected by those headlines. So as soon as they can get the hourly bounce underway, we will be looking for the size of the daily bounce in relation to 143.38. Get me high enough, right? 62%, 78% recapture of this move. And you give the bulls a great chance at resetting for a new daily uptrend. But give us a weak bounce on the hourly before rolling over and the daily downtrend will simply continue and we will continue to be in this extended weekly consolidation. Now we are coming up on a very pivotal level here, guys. The bottom end of this range of support, this green box right here, is gonna be about 137. So crack the 137, and we definitely lose a very, very big level. You will then have to look all the way down to about 133. In terms of the monthly, guys, monthly bulls are still in control right here, still just looking for the monthly higher low for further trend continuation, which is why I use this level right here, this 133, 133.50, prior resistance for your monthlies, that should be the large, large, large area of support. And for healthcare, that as well, top to bottom, would be a drawdown of roughly 9%, the same thing that we got last October, right? So we're already midway through a lot of these drops here, guys, for financials and healthcare. The ones that's been holding up the best is really QQQ, but your lead bulls, right, financials and healthcare are well underway to weekly consolidation and monthly consolidation as well. So maybe they will be the first to bottom out and then they can provide a bit of support for the S&P. If they bottom out first and start their road to recovery, that allows QQQ to have its pullback and then eventually, guys, everything will have bottomed and we'll be back to normal. There's no telling how much time that can take, but if you ask me for a rough, um, a rough area that I'm guiding for personally, most likely mid-May. The true bull market at that point, broad market rallies, Probably, guys, only going to start after your May Federal Reserve meeting, probably the mid-month of May. This is going to just going to be some time for some healthy consolidation. Moving on to our next one, SMH here. So SMH currently sitting minus 1.5% for the day. They were really not helped with some heavy declines in NVIDIA and AVGO over the course of the day here. So let's take a look at this, guys. The chart really has not changed. We're still looking for this line in the sand level right here. 213 incredibly important to protect the 213. Now we are in the context currently of this daily downtrend, right? On the weekly, we are still in a tightening range. The reason why 213 is so important is because if we lose 213, we set a weekly downtrend. We have not had a weekly downtrend. Guess when? Since the last fall sell-off, right? So this is a crucial pivotal level for SMH. They've been one of your lead bulls, but if they join Team Bear with financials and with um, healthcare as well, it will definitely not be pretty to say the least here, guys, right? So keep a close eye on that 213 on the daily. We're still relatively tight. Yes, it's a daily downtrend, but in terms of the weekly, guys, it is still a tightening range. So we need to see which of these two ways the range will break. Obviously, semiconductors have some bullish news. We have some earnings this week from them, right? We have earnings from uh, ASML this week, right, on Wednesday, and then TSMC on Thursday. Those could provide some relief. So I wouldn't count these bulls out of the race just yet. Need to see those earnings and how they project guidance for the entire industry moving forward. Keep in mind, guys, ASML and TSMC are two of the most important companies in the entire semiconductor business. ASML manufactures the machines that makes the chips that TMC manufactures, right? So these critical point for the markets to understand. If they continue saying that demand is extremely high and they guide for a bullish 2024 and 2025, semiconductors are gonna have a very good time. And if TSMC says the same thing, likely the same, semiconductors are gonna have a very good time. But if there's some timidness on any of those two company earnings in terms of guidance for this year, that is when you may get your eventual flush. And we may be looking in for a potential weekly downtrend. At that point, just healthy monthly consolidation, similar to last fall, just looking for the monthly higher low 
for further trend continuation when all of this fear and uncertainty gets behind us. Now moving on to IWM Russell. The Russell obviously not having that good of a day. Why? Well, because yields pretty much skyrocketed. They skyrocketed namely because of that hotter than expected retail sales report, right? The 0.7% uh, increase here in retail sales, not good for inflation, not good for yields, interest rates higher for longer. Good for the economy by all means, but for interest rates directly, not very good at all. 20 year yield uh, running severely today, right? They were up about 2.5% two, um, 2 almost. Uh, from the low, right? Uh, pretty much, no, not about under that, under 2%. And even the 10-year yield right here, about 1.6%. So those had very heavy increases today. Did not help your growth stocks. So unfortunately, growth stocks losing a lot of levels here, guys. Daily downtrend is clear as day right now. Any move higher, just going to be looking for a higher low, anything under 202.78. Higher, uh, lower high, excuse me, into lower low. Really not expecting much bullish continuation from your IWM Russell, especially since we lost the weekly higher lows as well. So it was a gorgeous weekly uptrend this entire time. Now we've lost the weekly higher lows. Any move higher at this point, guys, if we do recapture the daily, let's say for any which reason, I do expect this to just set weekly lower highs into lower low continuation, continuation of a weekly downtrend here, maybe into further monthly consolidation, which will bring us really to the midpoint of this range. Again, unfortunate because the Russell had the breakout going, now looking heavily like we may get dipped down into the 190, 185 area. So I'm not very bullish on the Russell and I don't feel any urgency to pick up this trade either. Not while yields are still hot, not while the inflation trade um, is still too uncertain and while we don't still have a finalized date for the first interest rate cut, guys, the Russell, you know, is going to be underperform until those interest rates start coming down. Now, moving on to the Dow Jones, guys, Dow Jones not looking the best either, right? Daily downtrend, clear as day right now, daily oversold conditions almost on the Dow Jones. These would be the first daily oversold conditions since, well, you guessed it, last October. So we're hitting a lot of uh, a lot of key pivotal moments at the same time in terms of uh, relevancy to last October, right? Clear daily downtrend, well below your moving averages, completely lost those at this point. Weekly, loss of the weekly uptrend as well too, right? So loss of these weekly higher lows. We had those last week. They just continue at this point. I would not be surprised even if we get some daily uptrend recovery right here. Let's just say, right? I would not be surprised if we get a weekly lower high into lower low, continuation of a weekly downtrend, potentially for the rest of the month of April, unless big tech earnings saves us. And that would just be for further monthly consolidation here, guys, right? Looking for the monthly higher low for further trend continuation when all of this negativity gets behind us. That area is going to be 36,800-ish, down to about 35,500. So keep a close eye on this level. Previous all-time highs, previous resistance as well should be acting as a gorgeous area of support for the bulls. And I'll remind you, that would be a sell-off of anywhere between 8 to about 10%. And you guys guessed it, that is pretty much the exact same amount that we dropped last October too. So keep a close eye on that for the Dow Jones. We're already, guys, more than half of the way done at this point, right? So just let's be optimistic and let's build our shopping lists on the MACD. MACD obviously crossing to the downside. MACD, guys, just not looking healthy, right? The first time these weekly crosses have manifested since last October, and usually when these things do cross, guys, they take a while to rectify themselves. This is not like losing the daily. When you lose the weekly, it takes weeks and weeks and weeks to recover. It's not a snap your fingers event, right? So just keep that in mind please. Now let's move on to crypto. So crypto also got to cover this because crypto obviously a big asset in the context of geopolitical concerns. So crypto did have a very nasty sell-off day on Saturday when Iran was launching the missile strike towards Israel, right? So in the context of Bitcoin right now, daily downtrend is confirmed. So at this point, just maybe looking for the lower high into lower low continuation. In my opinion, guys, crypto is not going to be saved from these geopolitical concerns. And if the broad market continues to sell off, I don't believe crypto will be able to be a safe haven for uh, investors right now. So we're keeping a close eye on these weekly lows right here. 61,000. If you do lose 61,000, it'll be a weekly downtrend. Then we look to further areas of support down here at about 57 all the way down to 55,000 for a nice pickup zone for Bitcoin. That would just be monthly consolidation. Look at this gorgeous monthly uptrend right now. Just looking for a little bit of monthly consolidation, maybe down here, lower 60, high 50s, monthly consolidation for continuation of the uptrend. The halving event is literally in five days at this point here, guys. Crucial moment in time. Is it gonna be a sell the news event just because it's the halving? No, but could people use it as a sell the news event because other things across the world are going bad right now? 
Absolutely. So that is pretty much the moral of the story here, guys, for Bitcoin. Not looking, um, not looking the worst because the bulls are still protecting these areas right here. But in the midst of overall market weakness, I don't believe crypto is going to be spared. If anything, it represents a gorgeous buying opportunity for anybody who has not had so far an entrance into Bitcoin or uh, some other cryptos for that matter. I'll just remind you guys, by the end of 2025, my price target for Bitcoin is between $125,000 and $150,000. And that is fairly conservative in my opinion. Keep in mind, guys, the money is still not free in the markets right now, right? Interest rates are still high. Corporations are still not leveraged in terms of debt. And VC money, your venture capital money, angel investor money, is still not what it was at the height of these rallies. It's still in the beginning stages of a bull market right now. We have barely even scratched the surface, so looking very good on a longer term basis. Now, in terms of Ethereum, guys, Ethereum largely following the same path as Bitcoin right now, so daily downtrend clear as day. Looking for the lower high into lower low. Obviously, this 30 to 50 range is gonna be a very big area of resistance, guys. The moving averages are resistance, horizontal resistance as well, so leads me to believe that further downside is probably likely in Ethereum which is going to just further this weekly downtrend as well. Ethereum is in a weekly downtrend. We have clearly flushed the lows, something that Bitcoin is not yet doing, right? So Bitcoin holding up better. Ethereum already in weekly downtrend, which means that Ethereum is officially in its monthly consolidation uh, zone right now. So just looking for a monthly higher low, anything above 1550, just looking for that monthly higher low for further trend continuation. In my opinion here, guys, 27 down to 25 should be the likely zone in which the bulls find some larger support. So if we do come down into that area, it would be a significant drop, but would represent a very beautiful buying opportunity in my opinion. So now let's move on to our big tech names. Give me a quick second. All right, so big tech names. So Apple down about 2.19% on the day. So Apple, as we were saying last week, right? Apple benefiting from two days of rally while the rest of the market was largely red, even on Friday. Whole market was red, but Apple was green and Apple was not able to do it forever. They even consolidated today. So what are we looking for on Apple? With this big engulfing move, the bulls have created enough space to reset the daily uptrend, right? We were in an extended daily downtrend this entire time. Engulfing move. Now we have enough space to set the daily higher lows for the potential daily trend change. But if the overall markets do not cooperate, guys, don't expect Apple to do something like this. We may just continuously get trapped in these areas right here. Apple slid on the day, largely because of the conditions of the overall market, but also because a research report came out and said that Apple had delivered 10% less phones in this quarter than in the same quarter last year. And that's obviously a big decline in sales volume. So it remains to see if that is true. And we're gonna hear all about that on, to, on uh, the May 2nd earnings report from Apple. As of now, the bulls still looking good for a bounce here, right? Still above our short-term moving averages, but they need to put a stop to this soon if they want to be able to control this move and potentially reset the daily uptrend, which would take, which would really take this this scale of this weekly bounce into the 180 level, which is going to be your next big area of resistance. As of now, though, guys, Apple really in a in a zone of in between. If the overall context of the market was bullish, right? excuse me, bullish right now, I would say that Apple has no problem, no trouble at all of recovering this daily uptrend. But with current market conditions, guys, could we potentially revisit these lows? Very, very probably. So just stay cautious on Apple. Try to get the best entries as possible. No immediate urgency, in my opinion, guys, for these markets since Spy and QQQ are now pretty much in weekly consolidation and monthly consolidation as well. I don't believe there's any urgency to be picking up heavy amounts of shares. Just go slow, wait for the market to come to you. And for me, that will be a retest of your lower 170s, high 160 range. Now moving on to AMD. So AMD once again coming down on the day, 1.81% to the downside. AMD top to bottom at this point from the height of the rally, down 30%, considerable amount from their peak in uh, early March, right? In just over a month at this point, heavy sell pressure from AMD. We're now coming down into our last area of defense right now. The area that held up so well in January and February is now in jeopardy of being lost. That is the previous big area of support. And it is also your previous all-time high area. If we do lose this area, guys, we're coming right down. 150 to 140 is the next big area of support. So keep a close eye if the bulls are able to protect this. 
if they are to put up some protection, they have to do it now here, guys, right? So on the hourly, need to see that hourly trend change to the bulls to give us our daily bounce underway. And then we need to get as high as possible in relation to 171. If we can get an engulfing move above 171, we can have a chance of changing this daily trend to the upside. And then we will have to deal with overhead resistance at about the 182 mark. But if we, de if we deliver a little bit of a bounce here or even flush below the support zone, that'll be worst case scenario we're going to use this as resistance, set the lower high, and then trend lower towards the 140 level, which is going to be the next big area of support. So AMD, not looking the best right now, if I'm to be honest with you. Even on the weekly here, guys, clear weekly downtrend right now. We're expecting a bounce from the bulls, but the bounce, in my opinion, could just be a temporary, re temporary relief bounce. Set the lower high into lower low just for extended further monthly consolidation at this point. My AMD really on its second month, of monthly consolidation at this point still in the context of a gorgeous monthly uptrend here guys looking for the higher low for further trend continuation eventually so be patient on amd if this is one that you want we're gonna have to be patient with it right i would really like to get uh, some long-term shares for my long-term share portfolio 140 that would be great in terms of swing trades we did the video last night here guys once again i'm targeting if you can get better than 150 150 and below that would be a very uh, nice trade opportunity down here, guys. But be very cautious with the current conditions of the markets. Moving on to Amazon now. So Amazon, 1.35% of the downside in the context of this daily uptrend still. But we're coming very close to our most recent higher lows at 182.60. Lose the 182.60, you lose the daily uptrend. You set up the bears to set the lower high into lower low flush. And then we'll be keeping a very close eye on the level we just broke. That would be the 178, this yellow line right here. Huge prior area that we broke into, set the all-time highs, and now we may just be pulling back into. Luckily for us, our weekly higher low is below that at about 171.50. So the bulls still have tons of space to consolidate prior to your earnings. Earnings coming up pretty much next Thursday here, guys. Not this Thursday, the one after. So in my opinion, Amazon will have fairly muted price action prior to their earnings cycle. I don't believe they get through this big area of support sitting about the 174.75. Even if markets are relatively bearish for the next uh, week and a half, guys, earnings is really going to be the make or break for this uh, whole region around the 174, 178 region, right? So keeping a close eye on Amazon, Amazon still one of our lead bulls, but if it too joins Team Bear, daily downtrend and weekly consolidation, well, then everything is going to be pointing in the same direction. And that direction, unfortunately, until earnings at least, is going to be down. Now moving on to Google. Google down heavily today, 1.8% to the downside. Google as well was one of your lead bulls and now starting to lose a lot of ground quickly. So very nice daily uptrend by your bulls right here. Now the daily, the bears have pulled back a lot into this move, still not losing the 12 EMA. Any move lower at this point, still looking for the higher low, anything above 151, looking for a daily higher low and a attempt at least at continuation by the bulls. But if ever we lose too much and then we get the attempt in the context of overall bearish markets, we could set the lower high into lower low flush. And that would just mean weekly consolidation for Google. Good thing for Google, Google has a ton and ton of space to set that weekly higher low, guys. Anything above 131.50, just looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation. In my opinion, since earnings are so close, they're coming up next Tuesday, not this Tuesday, the one after. In my opinion, price action going to be fairly muted until that time. I don't really believe here, guys, uh, that we come down much below this whole area right here, 150, 151-ish, let's call it. I don't believe we get much below that area in the next coming weeks, even if markets are relatively bearish. So keep a close eye on that zone right here, and then it'll be all up to earnings to determine whether or not Google can then manifest a rally back to the highs or whether or not we continue this weekly consolidation, maybe as low uh, coming towards the gap fill here. If earnings are underwhelming, could maybe be expecting the gap fill towards the 144. Uh, that would be in the negative case scenario. So we're gonna keep our eyes peeled on Google, but definitely one of our lead bulls also showing some weakness today. Moving on to Meta right now. So Meta down 2.28% as well. Also, one of our lead bulls starting to steadily lose ground right here. So let me just replace these two lines by a green rectangle because I like the rectangles more. I feel that they're more uh, evident on the chart. So we can see right here that currently your meta bulls have now lost the daily uptrend, right? We were looking for the continuation of this daily uptrend after last Thursday's good 
uh, relief, right? But unfortunately, Friday and today, geopolitical headlines just ruining it for Meta as well. Even though, even though Meta's business has absolutely nothing to do with the conflict, if anything, right, it'll just bring even more eyes to their platforms, right? News articles and stuff like that. If anything, it should actually boost advertising revenue because there's more eyes on the platform. No more people uh, are searching for the news, right? So in terms of the sell-off, daily downtrend, now we look to these lows right here. What are these lows, guys? They are the weekly higher lows of this massive, massive, massive weekly uptrend that we've pretty much held, you know, fittingly since pretty much last October, last fall, when we were kind of in this muted range right here. Well, now, guys, this is the area to protect. If we lose these lows right here, talking about 48, 488 down to about 476, you will lose the weekly uptrend and you set up the bears to pull in the weekly downtrend. However, that's not going to happen without bearish earnings. Earnings coming up in two Wednesdays time. So in my opinion, guys, it's going to be very, very unlikely for the bears to be able to fracture this whole area of support without the bulls putting up a fight before our earnings. There's not that many trading days left, um, you know, before next Wednesday, right? Maybe only about six, six, seven days of trading left. So could we expect just a muted daily downtrend into this level and then earnings? Earnings is either going to send us back up to the highs or just crush this and end up in monthly consolidation. That is the type of pattern I'm looking out for here, guys. So keep your eyes pool, keep your eyes peeled on Meta. So far, giving it up one of your lead bulls now also joining the team bear on the daily. So far, not in jeopardy of using losing the weeklies just yet. So let's watch for out for that on Meta. Now, Microsoft. Microsoft as well, one of your lead bulls leading into this week, losing a key level of structure. We are now dipping back below into our previous range of consolidation. This is the range that Microsoft was trapped in a better part of February and early March. We are now back into that. So it was a look above. It was a weekly bull flag, but the overall conditions of the market were not beneficial enough. And now Microsoft too, starting to come undone a little bit. Now, it's still not a weekly downtrend yet. We are still looking for any weekly move lower, anything above 398, just looking for a weekly higher low for further weekly trend continuation. But now that we're back within this range of consolidation, it could be very easy for the bears to set a lower high and just trap us into this region, guys, until our earnings on Thursday, the 24th of April. That is two Thursdays from this point. So a lot of big tech earnings next week, gonna be a crucial week. Microsoft dips back into this range of consolidation. Once again, earnings is going to do one of two things. We're either going to send us back up to the highs and make an attempt at continuation on these weekly uptrends, similar to the meta chart I just showed you, or we're going to come down to this range. And if Microsoft shows softer than expected earnings, well, then we may end up at risk of losing this range right here and heading into extended monthly consolidation the rest of April and maybe even early May, which will just be hunting for a monthly higher low. And the bulls have so much space, anything above 311, just looking for a monthly higher low for further trend continuation. Microsoft top to bottom, even in times of despair, never drops too much. You can see this sell off top to bottom in October was roughly, you know, 10, 14%. I know that sounds like a lot, but so far, guys, we're already down about 4% from the highs. So that would just be another 10%. And that would really put us right in line. 381. 381, key point, guys. 381 is literally where I want to buy Microsoft. It's literally the last range of consolidation. So looking forward to that if it does happen. Now moving on to Netflix. Netflix as well, one of your lead bulls so far is now losing ground, setting the daily downtrend. This is the first time they set the daily downtrend since back here in February. And this one seems to be slightly more aggressive with the overall conditions of market sell-off. We've now lost both our moving averages in one single day, something we've not done in the past three months. Earnings from Netflix on Thursday, of course. So price action for the week, even though we have a daily downturn right now, very tough to say, guys. Earnings can send this either way. If it's a negative news event, then expect consolidation, which will send us most likely into the 575 region. That's our first line of defense. And the last line of defense is your weekly higher lows right here at 550. So 575, 550, that is the pocket that I'm looking for for Netflix on the downside. And if we stay relatively here and the same price range as now, that could be downside all the way to about nine, nine and a half percent after earnings to the downside. Obviously, bullish catalyst to the upside. If earnings are very, very good, then we may just recapture this entire move in the form of a gap up trade like we had back here. And at that point, guys, we would be heading into weekly breakout territory once again on Netflix. And at that point, we will be eyeing our next area of all time highs, 691. But there's a nice, there's a big thing in my mind as well here, guys. 
whereby if earnings from big tech are good and a lot of names do this, but our macro is not that good and geopolitical, geopolitical tensions are still high at the time, it may just be a case of selling off positively, uh, positi any positivity right in these markets. So keep a close watch on that for Netflix. Now moving on to NVIDIA. So NVIDIA down about 2.5% on the day. Not a very good day for them as well, right? In the context of this daily downtrend, we tried to put in an engulfing move last week, and now we're starting to unravel once again. So keep a very close eye on these lows right here. 835, the level to watch. If we lose that area, guys, we lose this daily engulfing move, and you are simply plunged into further and further weekly consolidation at this point. No earnings to save NVIDIA just yet. NVIDIA earnings are all the way at the end of the month of May. So at this point, guys, NVIDIA is really beholden to other company earnings that will have a direct correlation with them. Some of your large semiconductor names come out this week and a lot of other of them come out a lot of other of them come out next week too. So keeping a close eye on Nvidia if ever we lose the 850 level, well the next area of concern for me guys is going to be all the way down here at 750. It is the earnings breakout level. The next area of decent support for your bulls is going to be down there. So keeping a close watch on this for NVIDIA. One thing's for sure, if we continue this weekly consolidation a bit further, that will lead into monthly consolidation and I will be looking to buy any and all dips if we dive down 750, 740, extremely, extremely juicy sell-off area for NVIDIA and that would bring them down from their highs about 22%, very juicy, attractive discount for a company that's doing all but, you know, the best things in the world for uh, the advancement of technology right now. I really think that NVIDIA has no problem to hit that $1,000 mark over the course of the tail end of the year or maybe even early 2025. So picking, up, picking it up down here in the 750 range does represent a very juicy trade opportunity. Now moving on to Tesla. Tesla not with a very good day at all, right? So Tesla down five and a half percent they laid off you know they had a headline today that they were laying off about 10 percent of their workforce potentially up to 20 percent of their workforce in certain divisions elon musk looking to protect those margins looking to protect that free cash flow and how do you do that well unfortunately employees are a heavy cost and he chose to lay he chose to uh, reduce a lot of his workforce today traditionally that is a bullish catalyst for most stocks but unfortunately guys the market just did not like that news over the course of the day leading into our earnings earnings are going to be next tuesday and we're flirting now dangerously with these lows at the 160 level break these unfortunately guys at this point daily downtrend is now back to the bears your weekly lower highs are now set in this whole 178 180 region so your weekly downtrend very sad to say guys because i really like this stock a lot you know it's a really shame what's happened to the stock but we got to say it got to call it how it is right no emotions just objective analysis weekly downtrend likely to likely to continue at this point we will be looking to our 150 lows to be the last line of defense because under that guys it really doesn't get uh much better right we're kind of looking to the 130 level after that to act as uh further support if we do lose that 150 but price action in my opinion here guys right depending on market conditions price action will probably be fairly muted i'm not saying we can't visit these levels prior to earnings if the rest of the market does have a very red week this week right we may just dip down into the lower 150s and then it'll be all up to your earnings whether or not the company can save face with positive earnings right and start this daily dot trend anew and give your weekly bulls a fighting chance but if earnings are bad guys i really believe this will be the mother of all flushes for tesla if we flush this level the fear will be off the charts at this point. We'll be hitting daily oversold. We may be even delving into weekly oversold territory if that happens, guys. And that will represent a perfect buying opportunity if you're a long-term investor in Tesla. To DCA small, to start some starter positions, 150s, and depending how low we go, guys, that is where I will personally be looking to reevaluate my holdings in the company to see if I'm going to add in these lower sections. It'll all depend off of earnings. We're going to cover earnings on the channel together, of course. That'll be a good indication if Tesla can be a buying opportunity or if we still have to be patient because there's more pain down the line. We've gone to Palantir at this point, guys. So Palantir, not looking the best here today, guys. 3.4% to the downside, and we got rejected from the exact level that I was pointing out for the past two weeks. This 23.0, this 23.10 level has been very problematic for the bulls in the past three weeks at this point. Daily downtrend now is well underway once again. 
below our resistance, below the moving averages. Momentum at this point, right, also pointing heavily to the downside in terms of your weekly MACD cross for the first time since your earnings rally last quarter. So that is notable to us. Weekly downtrend as well. Where do we look out for the bulls now? Well, it's this whole 2150 down to about 19 area, right? That is going to be the bottoming out area for Palantir, in my opinion. That would be downside roughly uh, of anywhere between, you know, 20 all the way down. If we hit all the way down to about 19, that would be 20 to about 30% worth of a sell-off. If you've been waiting uh, for, if you've been waiting for a sell-off in Palantir, guys, this is going to be the opportunity to pick these lows. So that's what we're looking out for, for the bulls here, guys. As of now, the bears in full short-term control of your daily, full short-term control of your weekly downtrend as well, just in healthy monthly consolidation, looking for the monthly higher lows down 21 down to $19. So let's pay a close attention to that on Palantir. Palantir not with earnings until the early part of May. Now, lastly, moving into PayPal. So PayPal also heavily selling off here down, uh, heavily selling down uh, today, guys, 1.67% to the downside. So unfortunately, PayPal, guys, well, PayPal now, right, losing the daily uptrend altogether, sets up the bears for lower high into lower low, daily downtrend continuation, losing the 200 MA as well, and potentially in for further weekly consolidation as well on PayPal. I said it, guys, last week, too little, too late for PayPal. Unfortunately, they did not break out high enough to get above our areas of congestion, right? That 63 to 60 level, 63 down to 60 is still on the table currently, for some potential drawdowns in these markets, right? So keep a close attention on these levels right here. In my opinion, PayPal will not be saved. Even though we're in an area of technical breakout, if the markets continue their downward spiral, well, PayPal is just going to also continue in a downtrend as well. So as of now, the bulls still in control of this weekly coming up into a crucial area, guys. 63 down to 61, very important area of support. I will not be playing this one. I've wa I've wanted to play this one here, guys, but I just don't trust the overall market conditions right now. The only stocks I am playing right now are extremely high conviction trades. And I'm not saying that PayPal isn't a high conviction trade for me, but it'll be a lot more high conviction if I can pick it once again below $60. That would still be a very juicy buying opportunity for me. So PayPal really selling down as a byproduct of overall uh, market weakness. Just a case of too little, too late for PayPal. When it was finally starting, finally starting to spread its wings, the market unfortunately starts selling off as a whole. So PayPal going to have to be a bit more patient on this one. So that's pretty much everything that we did for our stock market rundown today. Hopefully that was insightful for everybody. If you guys enjoyed the video, I really apologize for these long videos, guys. But I understand a lot of people are concerned. Maybe a lot of people are a bit fearful of the markets right now. So that's why I should explain what's been happening over the weekend. I promise you the rest of this week's videos, I will really try to keep them under 40 minutes, even if we do have some earnings to include in those as well. So hopefully all of that is educational for you guys. If you like the video, consider dropping a like, consider subscribing to the channel if you're new as well. We would love to have you here. And lastly, guys, if you have any questions at all, please leave them down below in the comments. Anything you want, you want me to look at a specific stock, technical analysis on something, on options trade you're considering, anything you want, leave it down below in the comments and I'll be happy to answer within the first 24 hours. Take care. I'll see you guys tomorrow after the close. Peace.